projects, crafting, tinkering, and repurposing materials in useful and creative ways. Today I'll be sharing a small renovation project that I did, focusing on a particular detail that I decided to incorporate into the design, which is this applique right here. In this case, it was created to be attached to a piece of furniture, which is a common use for appliques. Not this particular one right here. This one I embedded magnets into, but um, these appliques, which you can see mounted to the shelving unit, the first step in this project doesn't require any explanation really, we just have to make our decision. What do we want this thing to look like? So on to step two, which involves weighing out our production options. There is no end to the amount of reasons there can be for choosing one over the other, but the most common factors are time and cost. I chose to 3D print this project for several reasons. A few of them being that, one, I wanted to create a video involving 3D printing. Two, I wanted to ensure a clean looking finished project. Three, my time is stretched thin among various projects and printing allows me to accomplish more things simultaneously. This design also would have been a good candidate for some other crafting methods, given its very uncomplicated geometry. I threw a few on the list here just to give some examples and spark some ideas. So I won't go into depth now other than saying that there are various approaches that can be taken to create a laminated, sculpted, or casted project. And they are all feasible no matter your level of expertise. The materials are not hard to come by, may even be in your home already, or can be sourced from recyclable materials that would otherwise go to a landfill or recycling center. Step 3. Since I chose to 3D print, my next step is to find or create a 3D file. With websites and communities such as Thingiverse.com and Thangs.com growing, it's becoming more and more likely that your desired object already exists in a library somewhere just waiting for you to download it. However, even if this particular design was out there in 3D format already, it would be quicker for me to just use an image file to generate a 3D model since it is merely a linear extrusion of a profile. To do this, we move on to step four, finalizing and preparing the image. You may choose to complete step one with a hand-drawn sketch, a computer-generated image, or by selecting an image from a search engine. Whatever the approach, the final file format needs to be something called a scalable vector graphic. The reason is that raster formats are not formulaic and instead save their color information in a finite grid arrangement. A vector graphic provides closed loop geometry because every part of the image is mathematically derived, therefore infinitely scalable without losing resolution. 
and provides 3D software the closed boundaries it requires to generate a solid object or mesh. The three programs that will be part of the demonstration will be Inkscape, GNU Image Manipulation Program, or GIMP for short, and Blender, all three of which are completely free and open source. Let's begin with GIMP, the raster graphics editor, to clean and prep an image file. First, I'll demonstrate a likely scenario. Suppose you got your image off the internet. Besides some tweaks to the design, or sharpening up lines, you may have a watermark that needs to be removed. I am not condoning any use that violates a copyright, but depending on the usage, particularly if it's a non-commercial use, you may be free and clear to use this image for your personal project. I'll demonstrate that procedure in brief. The file type of the image happens to be a PNG file, which means it saves extra information, like transparency levels and layers, rather than one flat image. That information is actually going to get in our way for what we want to do, which will be demonstrated. First, we will remove the color from the image. The quickest and simplest way to do that is to change the image settings to grayscale, under Image, then Color Mode. Now we are going to use a tool called Threshold and see what can happen if there is transparency information or possibly other information saved in the file. Notice that in the Threshold toolbox, there is this window that only has a few vertical lines and one of them is not evenly spaced like the others. As we slide the markers along the scale here, we find that no matter where we set our cutoff points, there will always be some text remaining. And the only substantial change that happens is when a marker crosses over that oddly placed vertical line. Let's cancel that operation. Now we will right click on the image in our layer menu and select Flatten Image. The image loses transparency. What appeared as a gray before was actually lower and higher concentrations of black, whereas now we actually have varying shades of gray between black and white. Let's open the Threshold tool once more and compare. You can see that the values being displayed in that same window are different than before. And now we can find the most ideal place to set our markers to capture the best possible outline of the design. After that, we can do some small manual touch-ups to clean up any bleeding effects. Various tools can accomplish this task. I'll select the eraser tool. Notice that even with the color blue selected as the background color, when I erase, it creates a gray patch because our image settings are set to grayscale. So no matter what, all the values will be converted to grayscale values. Once we've touched it up to our liking, we will go up to File and export this as a JPEG. We can close out of GIMP now and switch over to Inkscape and open up that JPEG file. As it is first displayed on our screen, the image seems sharp and clean, but if we zoom in, we can see the edges become fuzzy and blurred because of the finite resolution of the current file type. Creating a scalable vector file is as simple as selecting our object, then going up to the Path menu, and selecting Trace Bitmap. Hit OK to see the path generated. Now we can zoom in and compare. Our traced path remains clean and distinct, no matter how far we zoom in, while we can see the original image blur out next to it. We will delete the original image, then go up to File, Save As, extension SVG, Scalable Vector Graphic. On to the next step, Blender. 
Okay, let's start a new file. Delete the cube. Import the SVG file. It has appeared in the scene and also the outliner being displayed in the upper right hand window. If we look in the outliner, we can see that it is a path. When we zoom in, we see that the path has inner and outer boundaries. A path file can be given thickness by opening the Object Data Properties tab. Expanding the Geometry section and then setting a value to extrude it by. Though it appears to be a solid object now, we need to apply a few more steps to it. If we switch over to Edit Mode, we can see how an object's construction is mapped out. We should see faces and edges connected at vertices, creating the mesh, or skin, of the object. That doesn't exist yet because it is still present as a path file. Right-click the object to find the Convert option, and select Convert to Mesh. Now when we switch back to Edit Mode, we can see how our mesh is constructed. At this point, the object could be exported, but one final step can help if the object is experiencing some trouble in your slicer or printer. There is a tool called Remesh found under the Modifiers tab that we can apply. Now the mesh is created with an evenly mapped placement of vertices. We can go up to File, Export, and select an appropriate 3D file type. I'll use OBJ, Object, file type. Now we import our file into a slicer, which is able to analyze the file, slice it into layers, generate paths, and apply parameter data to the file for supplying the 3D printer with settings data and a toolpath to print the part. I'm using the Ultimaker Cura slicer, which is compatible with numerous 3D printers. It is even capable of generating printable geometry from 2D images, and supports a wide range of file types. Of course, importing 2D images directly into the slicer will severely limit your ability to edit them, as the software is not equipped with modeling tools. Here we can see an example of what can be generated from a JPEG file. This feature can speed up certain operations, 
depending on the kinds of projects you are working on, since it can eliminate some steps. Let's open the OBJ file. I can tell that it is all ready to scale, so it doesn't need to be enlarged or shrunk. The dimensions of the model appear in the lower left corner. Depending on the filament being used, the complexity of the model, and the desired print quality and durability, we can alter various settings to ensure the best possible print. Parts can be solid or printed with various densities and infill patterns. If the part is detailed or delicate, print speed can be slowed down to ensure there is no bounce, wiggle, whiplash, or vibration from the print head being moved about on the gantry. Once the desired settings are entered, the part can be sliced. We receive a very accurate estimation of how long it will take to print and how much plastic will be used in both grams and meters. We can even analyze the toolpath. This is particularly useful in the event that something peculiar occurs during the print and you want to go back and study the motion of the nozzle in that segment of the path. Now, depending on your setup, we can print directly from the slicer or save your G-code file and transfer it to your printer with some sort of flash media. Fourth.
just to plug up these dimples. Thank you.